2 Corinthians in chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. We've been in a series that we'll finish with next week on the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. We begin with the um, by pointing out that the cross of Jesus means different things to different people. You can take the cross and you can talk to just go out and do a survey and you could say to somebody, what does the cross mean to you? And you'll find that it means something to a lot of people, but the question is not what does it mean to you. The question is what is the cross? What is the cross of Jesus Christ? And we found from the scripture very plainly that 2 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, describe what the cross is to the person who's never come to Jesus. The Bible said that there's two teaches there's two categories of, of lost individuals. With regard to nationality, there's the Jews and then there's the Gentiles. But without Christ, without his cross, uh, they would both be lost. And to the Jews, the Bible says it's a stumbling block. It's something that causes them to stumble. And uh, the Jews, the Bible says, require a sign in that passage of Scripture. But it says the Greeks seek after wisdom. And to the Greeks or the Gentiles, the Bible says the cross of Jesus is foolishness. And, uh, boy, that's true, isn't it? Share the cross of Jesus and... Uh, boy, you just go and you tell them about what it means to the lost person, what the cross is, and they'll say, well, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. Or I've had people that are lost say, well, that makes a lot of sense, but I'm not sure I believe it. I don't know if I can believe it. You know, I'd have to know it's true before I could believe it. And ultimately what they're saying is it doesn't make enough sense to me or it's foolish. In my mind, in my wisdom, I can't comprehend the cross. But the Bible says in that passage of Scripture, unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And that's what the cross of Jesus is to the believer. The cross to the lost individual is either a stumbling block that causes them to say, that isn't what I'm looking for, that isn't what I want, that isn't what I need. And there's other individuals that would say it doesn't, doesn't make sense. It, I just I don't think I could believe that. But friend, I want to tell you something. You trust Christ as your Savior, you receive Him. Am I supposed to dismiss kids' church this morning? Was I supposed to? Kids, get out of here. Um, I'm sorry. You can leave. If you don't want to leave, stay. <laughs> um, we're just going to keep them today? All right. Why don't we just let's just keep them? We, I messed up. I've messed up a lot of things this morning. Let's keep the kids. All right. Well, they like preaching too. Children are more intelligent than you think. <laughs> but the, the cross to, well, I was beginning to say, the cross to the individual who's received Christ is not a stumbling block and it's not foolishness. And I'll tell you why, because it's real. Something that happened when I got saved and God's Holy Spirit came and lived in me and a person who is looking for God to prove something to them or a person who is looking to comprehend something, it can't do for them because it's not personal. See, the cross is very personal, my friend. It has to do with the fact that my sin, which I committed very personally, was laid on Jesus and was nailed to His cross and that the righteousness of Jesus Christ was placed on me. And so myself, me as an individual who was the natural born enemy of God, who deserved to be judged by God because I'd sinned against God and because He couldn't be a righteous judge by tolerating my sin. He couldn't arbitrarily decide to forgive me. Sin had to be paid for. My sin was paid for in the person of Jesus Christ. And that made it very personal to me. The fact that I had, and by the way, I know people say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't think I've really sinned. I don't think it was against God when I sinned. And I don't think I should have to feel guilty for it. Friend, you do anyway, well, no matter what you think. Your conscience bothers you, whether you agree with that or not. You can't do sin. You can't commit sin and not get away with it. And I'll tell you something else. You know God's a judge whether you acknowledge it or not. You could uh, be here this morning. You could say, Pastor, well, I just don't think God has the right to judge me. Well, friend, somebody does, and somebody will. And I'll tell you something else. You, you got a double standard when you say that because you think God ought to judge other people, and that's a fact. I know people that are angry with God. They say, well, why does God allow sin? You tell me you don't think He ought to judge sin when you ask a question like that. Well, if God's good, then why did He let this happen? You think God ought to judge it. That's what you think. And so if God ought to judge somebody else, He ought to judge you as well. And He's the right person to do it because He's never sinned. Listen, I don't want somebody that's like me judging me. I don't want somebody that does the same kind of thing that I do telling me I ought to do what they do. Well, I need somebody that's perfect, and God's the perfect judge. He's a righteous judge. He's right to judge. And I'll tell you something else. His Son was the perfect sacrifice for sin, Jesus. And so when I got saved and my sin was placed on Jesus and His righteousness was placed on me, the cross 
meant something more than just uh, somebody that sacrificed and suffered and loved me. I'm telling you, it meant that I could have a fellowship with God. It meant that I was no longer God's enemy, that I no longer uh, needed to uh, have guilt. I deserved to have guilt, but it wasn't necessary anymore because my sin was placed on Jesus, and God said, because of the righteousness of Christ, I'll forgive that dirty, rotten sinner, and I'll have fellowship with him. You know, when I got saved, the cross meant that I not only was no longer the enemy of God, it meant that I could have access to God. The Bible teaches in almost every single place where it talks about salvation. Immediately after that, it talks about prayer and the fact that God is now our Heavenly Father, and we can go to where He is in heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we can ask God petitions, and He'll grant them, and God cares about me and answers prayer. You know what else happened when I got saved? I came to an understanding that, that I have a God who's not just arbitrarily in heaven, um, either interfering with things or messing with things for his own personal humor. I found out that I have a God who loves me personally and has cared with the minute details of my life. And that's a fact. And that's what the cross is to me. I'll tell you what else the cross is to me as a believer in Jesus Christ. It means that the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives and dwells in me. There's all kind of people that sincerely believe whatever their religion teaches. But I'll tell you what the difference between them and a Christian is. You know, we have a trite statement. It's a pretty good statement. It's, it is uh, that Christianity isn't a religion. It's a relationship. And that's true. But it doesn't explain to people that have never been saved. They don't understand that. They just think it's another trite statement. But what it does mean is God's Holy Spirit actually comes and lives in you and dwells in you and speaks to you. When, when God talks to you, it's not foolishness anymore. And it's not something that is a stumbling block to you. It's real. And when you have God's Spirit live and dwell in you, that's real, my friend. There's nothing more real than the relationship that you have when you trust Christ as your Savior. And the cross is the end of religion for a person and the beginning of a relationship with God. And so we saw what the cross was to the unbeliever. Then we saw what the cross is to a believer. We looked in Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6, and we looked specifically at a believer who does not mature, who is not everything he ought to be. And by the way, does God save us because we're everything we ought to be? No, He saves us because we need to be. He saves us because we're not what we ought to be. We need the righteousness of Christ. You need to be saved. That's why God does it. And so Christians that get confused about why God saved them or they get saved and they, they recognize their need for salvation, but all of a sudden they think that, well, I'm a good person and I need to live right and I need to do this. You don't understand why God saved you. He saved you because you needed it. Because you couldn't. Uh, there is no way you could make your sin go away. There's no way in the world you could offer to God a bargain or a deal that took away your sin. You say, Pastor, God ought to just forgive. He ought to be big enough to just let it go. You, yeah, ought he? Ought he? Should God be big enough to let it go? Let me ask you a question. Somebody murders someone that you love. Should you forgive them? Yeah, we're all nodding yes. Okay, let me ask you a question. Um, what if they murdered somebody again? Should you invite them to come live in your home? Uh, ultimately, sin ought to be judged. And as as good as we think we are when we judge God about judging sin. And the fact is, is that sin ought to have consequences. And a, and a murderer could ask forgiveness all he wants to, but he needs to pay for what he's done. And that's the bottom line. And you ought to pay for your sin as well. And you can't decide what sin is, you know, God should forgive. He should forgive mine, but he should let that person, well, that person's so bad, God oughtn't to forgive them, but he should forgive me. Friend, don't have a double standard. If God ought to judge sin, He ought to judge yours. He ought to judge mine. And He did in the person of Jesus Christ. And a person that judges his own son has a right to judge me, doesn't he? If He judged Jesus so that I could uh, escape His judgment, His wrath, don't tell me that God ought to do things a certain way. You don't have a plan. And I could never offer God a redemption plan. Well, we get saved that way, but then when we're trying to live for the Lord, many times we begin to struggle and sometimes... You ever met a Christian that just quit? You ever met a quitter for a Christian? I mean, they were, they were saved and they grew and they fit the description. That's in Hebrews chapter 6. I mean, they tasted of the heavenly gift. They'd, um, they'd seen God work in their life and do things, but because they hadn't grown, they quit. And the Bible says it could be impossible for them to be renewed again to repentance. It, it might be impossible for them. The Bible says because they crucified Christ afresh. And the cross to a person who is saved and not living for the Lord is a crucifix. The cross 
to a person who has trusted Christ as their Savior and does not go on in their faith is a crucifix. In other words, it's a dead Jesus.